Hello ladies and gentlemen and everybody else, we're going to take a look at um, day 3 of the play-ins We're going to just jump into the matches, no script, uh, no editing, that's how we do it on this channel I only know how to talk shit uh, Let's uh, jump uh, straight into it, today was action packed, we had two tiebreakers Let's uh, take a look at some of these drafts and summarize the games V3 versus LGD uh, V3 was a very sad story uh, throughout this tournament because they couldn't um, figure out how to draft even if their life depended on it. Uh, the biggest tragedy of this game is that Renekton and Leeson is on the same team against an Orn. Um, V3 is pretty much outscaled the moment Orn finishes a Bramble Vest or if he's feeling spicy and gets solo kills on the Renekton as he did, then you can just rush the Sunfire Cape. Renekton Leeson is a 2v2 that doesn't exist, there's nothing to gain here from picking Renekton. Leeson Zoe is uh, a little bit strong, uh, like the Leeson came in as a counter to Kindred, but I think um, most of the time you're just better off uh, picking potentially, you know, uh, maybe a Gragas into Kindred, because Gragas uh, manages to stay relevant in the game uh, for longer. Uh, something that's interesting about this game, something that we saw more frequently throughout the day was when um, the key junglers in the shape of uh, Lilia, Nidalee, Graves are out, this is where things uh, got a little bit spicy for, uh, you know, most of these teams. Uh, then you began to see Comfort come out, and Comfort for all of these players was just not that great. Ash first pick. In some situations I would agree, and I think Ash will be more impactful in the group stage, but Ash has not been... Uh, you know, that great in play-ins, if you take a look at that win ratio, you can look that up on yourself because I don't have the capability to pull it off, uh, pull it up on the screen right now. Uh, Senna has been the more successful AD carry, uh, partially because of how simple it is to execute on that champion. Ash requires a lot more coordination and um, I think that's important to note because uh, we haven't seen like any lane kingdom games, right? There isn't like some significant gap in lane phases, uh, barring some occasions when we see some solo kills. Usually, uh, with that in mind, we can... Sorry, I just read a comment that really blew my mind uh, uh, in the Twitch chat, which is really, really blew my mind. Jesus Christ. I was going to refocus myself. I lost my train of thoughts. I'm just gonna pick off with whatever I see. Uh, Orn and Kindred uh, gets locked in. Orn, uh, we spoke about it yesterday. Orn is um, so freaking good uh, when teams are uh, worse. Um, it just covers all of the weaknesses that teams usually have when it comes to uh, winning games. Uh, Orn makes you win based off time. Sometimes these games take a lot of time, and at the same time, it's a strong blind pick. Synergizes well with a lot of the meta junglers because it's just a tank that doesn't need that much attention while uh, your jungler is farming up and uh, doing things in the bottom side mid, and then he can always come up top and pick up a free kill with that Orn ultimate. So Orn is just incredibly powerful. So I'm all for Orn, especially in LGD's case, right? LGD just didn't know how to rally as a team, and uh, Bard and Orn are two very powerful ultimates to, uh, you know, rally around. Even this game wasn't that clean for LGD, they made some slip-ups here and there, and they gave up some kills. It was a very dirty game, but this is just, uh, you know, a draft, uh, uh, draft diffy, you know. Lee Sin gets picked into Kindred, Syndra is a counter into Zoe, and then the Renekton Braum 4-5 uh, is just uh, too silly. Like, the Braum isn't too bad, right? Uh, Ash Braum is okay, considering the enemy has Orn and... Um, I think, um, you know, there's arguments that you can block Syndra ult and some Jin bullets, but um, you're lining yourself up to give them a free bard, so you can definitely argue against it, and maybe it's just better to look for that Leona, but uh, the tricky part here is that the enemy team is just going to have a very easy to time being, like, buying Mercuries against Zoe, Leona, uh, but uh, maybe that's just the best course of action because you have Lee and Renekton on your team. So maybe it's just uh, one little way of trying to save it. 
I'm not much of a believer of picking Renaton into Orn, especially when you have Lee Sin Jungle. It was uh, a, a really, really a great tragedy. I think um, they either, like in this case, you just have to accept that uh, you might be weaker in lane, but when you see Jin Kindred Syndra, maybe you can just look in a mall fight. Sure, mall fight against Kindred maybe isn't the best because the Kindred Ultimate actually gains a lot of value, but there's also options of picking like a Maokai. That could be an option too. Um, I just don't see the teams and planes be good enough to execute on Renekton. But to be fair, I don't think any team in the world is going to execute on Renekton Lee Sin because it's just so, so bad together. The synergy is just not there. Uh, we continue on to the next game. Uh, R7 versus Unicorns of Love. R7 versus Unicorns of Love, which was uh, probably the biggest stomp of uh, the whole day. This was a crazy, crazy good game from R7. I was confused by their bans early on because these are bans that Unicorns of Love could potentially pull off. But they first picked the Camille, Nidalee was banned, uh, and then Ash was also banned, and then Renekton. Camille was first picked, and this is where things became a little bit strange. They went for the Wukong Senna. The Senna I agree with. I think Senna has looked super, super good in planes, even though um, there's been a nerf. I think the Camille Wukong matchup is arguable. Arguable in the sense that um, you can argue for both sides, but I think currently Camille is such a strong champion uh, that can, you know, always be active at every point in the game. And I don't think necessarily Wukong is a counter to Camille in lane phase. There are moments where Wukong, Wukong wins, there are moments where, where he loses. I don't think it's, um, you know, good enough to consider a counter at this stage because you're picking Wukong early. You know, R7 did something very clever in the fact that, you know, the moment they saw the Senna, uh, sure, the enemy has the option of going Senna Wukong, but you already showed Camille. So, like, the enemy is already showing uh, Camille 100%. Uh, you're not gaining anything from flexing Wukong here. Uh, Nautilus gets fourth picked, so that didn't matter anyway. Ezri Alistar gets locked in, and Ezri Alistar, if I'm Wukong and I'm playing against Ezri Alistar, it's just uh, so goddamn uh, tricky, you know? Uh, Ezri Alistair was a beautiful lock-in, and R7 had a borderline Exodia draft. Very, very nice uh, damage proportions here. Ezreal, Lucian, Camille together with an Evelyn. Uh, it is very tough to itemize against this team. You itemize Ninja, Tabai, you're going to have a hard time against the Evelyn, uh, and, and so forth. The Ezri Alistair was a very, very nice rotation, and they're going to, you know, get pushed in against Senna Nautilus, but... Uh, uh, that's a fine sacrifice to make because in the end R7 is going to play heavily into mid and uh, top side. Evelyn, Synergy with Lucian, Camille, the damage mix is super nice. Um, I want to have a discussion about Casio and Solution. Uh, in the past this was considered uh, somewhat of a, uh, not necessarily counter, it was always like a fine matchup for Casio, room to outplay. Uh, but if Lucian has enough space from his jungler to dash forward, this is definitely a matchup that Lucian could win. Cassio in early levels, after a lot of nerfs that she's received uh, in the past, uh, Cassio doesn't have enough power to uh, be uh, too present in uh, the early lane phase, so that's important to note out. Uh, Lucian can win easily uh, on first item, meaning Doran's played against Doran's ring. Uh, I think Lucian is favored, and then... Casio, uh, base timer on Tear of the Goddess, doesn't have a lot of stats, you know. Lucian has a lot of ways of winning this matchup, and I think uh, I would go so far as to favor Lucian. It's, of course, a skill matchup, completely a skill matchup, the same way Evelyn Casio is also kind of a skill check in terms of how you uh, talk about it. I'm just going to ban this guy because, uh, like, I don't know what my mods are doing because it's such an obvious, obvious ban. Uh, so maybe I'm going to remove some mods too because they're just uh, not awake. Uh, and nevertheless, we continue. Uh, this game started off uh, with Evelyn picking up a bit, a couple of kills. And you guys know always uh, with Evelyn, uh, when with any AP jungle, when they pick up a few kills, you get, you know, your blue jungle item, you push your clear speed to incredible, incredible numbers you clear the jungle fast and jose adodo i'm uh, 
I'm worried that I pronounce his uh, name wrong, but I believe that's it. Uh, dominated the game and really showcased that Evelyn is still really really strong even though she got a little tiny tiny nerf. We saw some Evelyn in the previous uh, days and that one wasn't uh, too exciting uh, but all in all R7 showed that they are capable of playing high level games uh, because R7 in their first match when they beat LTD that was very wonky and uh, that didn't make me that hopeful for R7. R7 also lost against V3 that honestly looked like a train wreck uh, throughout, this, throughout this tournament. So I think R7 definitely uh, gave me some hope for them in the coming best of five against LGD because that's how uh, the group uh, played out. This game was very, very clean on the execution. Uh, they were first on the rotations. Unicorns of Love, their composition doesn't have that many conditions to bring yourself back in. Uh, the draft had a lot of champions that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, a quality check, just are lower grade than the champions in R7 have. R7 just have high quality champions across the board. The only thing that really stands out is like Senna and Nautilus that uh, work well in multiple compositions and Wukong is uh, very, very niche. Like what does Wukong really do? against an Evelyn, Lucian, Ezreal, Alistar. That's the problem, right? Wukong was picked, and then four champions are fantastic into Wukong. So this was a massive draft victory for R7. Even with the Skana pick, it's a champion that is going to get kited, and Skana doesn't have enough early game impact uh, to you know, justify anything, really. Uh, he needs to wait till six, and Evelyn's going to reach that point already, and then uh, Evelyn can just choose her battles uh, very, very easily. She can choose to gank Borong, she can choose to gank mid, and that it's, it's very difficult to build vision around because of, obviously she's invisible. And uh, with the lane matchups being relatively stale, uh, it is hard to build uh, that uh, particular vision that you can add onto the camp. So R7 played a beautiful game, Unicorns of Love got completely outdrafted, and uh, they also got outplayed, honestly. We move on uh, to the next game, PSG versus V3. This one was um, the Kindred Syndra show. Uh, partially because PSG, you know, uh, Kong Yu, uh, Kong Ye is what uh, he was called apparently, and, uh, and uh, Uniboy played super, super well. Played super, super well, but at the same time, V3, you know, this is a big, big grief in draft. This was honestly a super, super big grief in draft. So we like the Orn. We don't need to discuss the Orn anymore. We see the jungle bands in, in Italy, Evelyn and Graves. So all of a sudden, you know, with Lilia ban, Evelyn ban, Set ban, all these jungle bands, uh, we're going to go deeper into uh, champion pools. So Kindred Blind Pick came, up, came out again here, which I enjoy more than the Echo Blind Pick, honestly. But um, yeah, uh, to, have, to each their own. Uh, Orn gets picked, Ash Renekton is the response, we already spoke about Renekton Orn, I think it's too tricky, and especially since all the quality AP junglers are banned already, there's no reason to really pick it, because Renekton is there to facilitate your AP uh, jungler. Uh, Senna Kindred gets picked, we spoke about Senna too, I think in play-ins she seems to just be better because it's easier to execute on Senna. And then you pick Galio third. Ace is a big Galio player, but picking Galio into Kindred, like Kindred is one of your biggest counters. They keep, they kept funneling champions into the Kindred here in this draft that made her so, so valuable. When you see a Kindred on the enemy team, what you want to do is you want to uh, find Poke, you want to find Kite. Already now with the Renekton lock-in, uh, you are semi-committed into this composition. But the moment you begin to lock in Galio and then Silas, you are heavy, heavy committing into it. And um, if we think about it, you know, if we, we would change up this Galio pick, uh, it could potentially be a Cartus, but I think Kindred is good into Cartus because of the interaction with the ult. Sure, there's ways where you can play it in a way where you can wait out Kindred's ult and then start channeling it and then maybe get a bunch of frags because, you know... Uh, the Kindred uh, ultimate keeps everyone at relatively low HP. There's some interactions there, but uh, just an AP jungler that goes together with Renekton uh, was uh, the best choice here instead of picking Galio. Like, picking Galio is just a joke. Like, even in a world here where they ban Orianna, there's so many champions that counter Galio and lane. And you guarantee yourself a week or two between mid two because, uh, like, what junglers are there to pick? Very few junglers uh, are there to pick here. 
Oriana is banned, uh, Bard is banned, and then Silas gets picked. Like even if they ban Syndra, you can even go so far as to pick Silas and you don't care about your damage. I mean, not Silas, you can pick Lucian and you can dominate Galio. You can pick so many different champions. You can pick Corky, you can go Azir. You can find millions of choices here that are going to be good into Galio. Galio is just an outdated champion that can be used maybe as a counter pick or together with a champion like Graves that is going to compensate for your weaknesses later on. Galio needs to play for his jungler and his jungler is Silas. His, Silas has some of the slowest clear speed right now if you think of junglers that uh, come to mind. I'm sure like someone's going to say, well, Swain jungle has a very slow... I, I don't care um, about junglers that come to mind. Silas is very, very slow. Uh, sure, Silas can be interesting for the Arnold, but when you've locked in Renekton, uh, you know, you consider it here. Here we try to piece it together. Like, why did they pick Silas? Is Silas going top, Renekton mid, Galio support? Like, what, what are they doing here? And there was no way to piece it together. With the Leona last pick, Mercury is the most valuable uh, item on the planet. Enemy need to hard commit into fights in order to start anything. And Kindred, Syndra are just born to be in that situation. And Orn also loves when people run into him. So easy to kite. The lane matchups looked completely fine on uh, Blue Side's favor. They scale better. They have a way stronger 2v2. And PSG just showed them that with a better draft... Um, it is easy for them to beat a, a team of the caliber of V3. V3 were very lost in this tournament in terms of uh, uh, preparation. Unicorns of Love versus LGD. So I wanted to note as well, R7 beating Unicorns of Love definitely saved... Um, uh, what's, what, what are they called? Uh, definitely saved uh, PSG because they were you know, in a position where... Uh, tiebreak wise, uh, like Unicorns of Love would be 4 0, and then there would be no tiebreaker, and Unicorns of Love would uh, straight advance uh, to the next portion of the tournament. Unicorns of Love, good plan right away, ban Orn, because LGD just couldn't function as a team without Orn, even though in this game there was some hope. There was some hope because uh, uh, Lang X, I don't know what the name is, Lang Shu or Lang Shin, Lang X, uh, solo killed the Camille. And then Silas solo killed No Man's. Like, she is solo killed. And at the same time, you know, Unicorns of Love decided to pick an Alistar against an Ezreal. So the reason why you wanted to go for the Alistar is it's okay-ish into Bard and it's pretty good against Lilia. And it's decent against Volibear. That's why they went for the Alistar. All right? But when Silas is open and you give Silas an Alistar ult, it is probably the best ultimate that you can grab as Silas. You know, you can argue maybe Swain ult or maybe Fiddle 6 ult, whatever. It is a an S-tier ultimate. It is a situation that you want to avoid at all costs. And uh, Silas with an Alistair ult almost uh, made a difference in this game. Almost. Almost, almost, almost. But LGD found a way to still stumble and fall. So Camille got solo killed. Uh, Syndra got solo killed a couple of times this game. Lee LGD were in a good position to win this game. But the thing that stood up above anything else was just this Twitch and Alistar. So in theory, Twitch and Alistar should not have a nice time against Bard and Ezreal. Uh, Alistar is very useless on level 1. Level 2, this is a lane that wants to scale into the game while um, Unicorns of Love get uh, very active in the top side of the map. But... Um, there was just a complete uh, juxtaposition of what was going on. Nidalee uh, was going into bottom side, trying to snowball Twitch after Syndra, uh, you know, got completely uh, dismantled. Uh, Camille got completely dismantled. Gadget got super, super feds. He grabbed a couple of kills. He roamed into mid, killed the Siles, got the shutdown, and did probably the coolest play all tournament long. Uh, uh, not all tournament long, maybe of, of, of day three. He just uh, triple killed on his own and that just uh, won the game because this Twitch was monster fed and LGD was just so scattered uh, all across the board. An honorable mention goes out to Ananasic when LGD did everything in their power to uh, shut down Twitch in a fight around the red buff. Uh, the Nidalee Spears were landing left and right and uh, uh, it was uh, super cool to see. There's been a big discussion about Nidalee builds in this tournament and I completely agree with the notion that uh, Athens is a very, very OP item on this champion into Ardent in a lot of cases. I think Road of Ages is too premium. 
I think uh, Zonias can be argued sometimes. I think a Magic Pen can be argued sometimes when uh, the enemy team, of course, um, don't have magic resistance and you are maybe single AP. I, I think that's uh, fine in some cases. Lich Bane is also a very premium item. When I say premium item, it's like a very uh, over expensive item for what you are achieving. And in this case, you have a Twitch that is super powerful in the game. The synergy of Athenes and Arden together is just so powerful because you get more AP off of mana region. And uh, these Nidalees are just too used to uh, some of their solo queue games when they are one shooting people with uh, Lich Bane and Road of Ages. But maybe uh, the fight wouldn't look as clean when Anasi carried if he itemized in that one direction. But uh, you shouldn't itemize uh, in preparation for mistakes, right? Because Twitch dying is something that maybe could have been prevented if, uh, if uh, Unicorns of Love uh, paid a little bit more attention. But uh, Gadget with a fantastic performance, Anasi with a fantastic performance. And it's cool to see Unicorns of Love being able to cover for their other players when... Uh, you know, in the previous games, uh, No Man's and also, of course, Boss uh, did a lot of the heavy work. So I'm just trying to find uh, the tiebreaker. So we had the tiebreaker here between Unicorns of Love and PSG. Uh, Unicorns of Love lost this one. Very surprising. So I said on the analyst desk that I would love to see Hanabi uh, just pick a GP. He just picks a Gangplank and uh, uh, does... Um, exactly what an Orn wants to do. I said it right before it. Um, I'm repeating it because uh, no one noticed on social media. I didn't get any credit for it. Uh, nevertheless, it's a pretty no-brain uh, call. Uh, Renekton gets first picked. Very similar draft to the last time. Orn Mordecai is a ban and then Camille gets banned and then they first pick Renekton. PSG was prepared for this. They went for a gangplank. Uh, surprising that Unicorns of Love actually didn't decide to ban, ban Gangplank in 4-5. It was pretty greedy to leave it to 5-pick Gangplank because honestly I can't think of what they would pick into Renekton. Maybe a Nar. Nar could be good. Maybe a Quinn. But then we go into dark territories where PSG weren't that great. Renekton, Renekton gets first picked and then Oriana Senna Prior. Two champions that uh, at this point in time when PSG locked them in had 100% win ratio. Oriana had... And Senna had uh, just super successful champion uh, champions in this play-in uh, so far. Senna just looks better in Ash in all of the games we've uh, seen so far. Oriana too, very well-versed champion that of course um, you know doesn't have any clear weakness because Phase Rush uh, compensates for that. She scales well, can play in very very different uh, modes and so forth. Hecarim and Ziggs gets locked in. Hecarim as the jungler now when Evelyn and Nidalee is out. Uh, Hecarim uh, is the choice. And in some situations, I would argue against this because, like Renekton and Hecarim, have very little synergy. But the idea here for Unicorns of Love is the fact that, uh, you know, the enemy is, um, is not there with some crazy counterplay against Renekton, right? So just to continue on this notion, you know, here, ideally, I would like to see a Lilia pick and then maybe in some situations just a Lucian. So a Lucian, Lilia, Renekton is something that we might see uh, at the World Championship. So Ekrem, Ziggs get locked in and Unicorns of Love. You have to kind of give them some faith after some of the drafts we saw so far in the tournament. Ziggs uh, is a flex pick, I assume. Lilia Oriana, of course, is um, two AP champions that don't synergize too well. Uh, rock and fourth pick with Leona Alistair Nautilus ban is uh, very, very natural. They go for Ezreal and Bard. Uh, Bard is something that can definitely find ways of trapping Senna and Oriana. Uh, similar to Rakan, is just a playmaker that is uh, almost always too good, good to have uh, within your games unless everyone has a dash on the enemy team, right? So Bard is just um, a simple lock-in that they go for. Um, I think the idea here was Unicorns of Love are either going to land on Rakan or Bard and then they can always look to pick the Ezreal um, and, uh, and be happy with it. GP gets 5th pick. So in this game Unicorns of Love managed to get ahead. Uh, they started off with a first blood in the mid lane uh, on Oriana. Uh, he died at a very sim silly timer. Bard roamed into mid and it was very very telegraphed. Unicorns of Love used this to snowball. Hecarim was in a good state. At one point, they were 6,000 gold ahead and they were uh, gunning towards getting an Ocean Drake. I mean, not Ocean Drake, but Ocean Soul, which involves, of course, Ocean Drakes. So it's not uh, completely irrelevant. But they over 
stepped. They overstepped big time. Uh, they tried to gank the GP and uh, they tried to go for a dive that worked in uh, previous situations within the game. And the tricky thing about PSG's composition, while they are very weak early, as you can see, like you have a GP and a Senna on the same team, Oriana Lilia to be two mid is very weak too. There aren't really any options of uh, creating harmful situations for the enemy team. Where is Gangplank really going to find opportunities? PSG did in fact uh, find a kill on Renekton once or twice and that put GP in a healthy state which was very very important but all in all Unicorns of Love had complete dominance over the map because their champions are just so much stronger uh, earlier on. Uh, there was no level 1 invade which is something that you can consider when you have Lilia and Gangplank because both champions are so strong level 1 uh, but uh, I guess after that game uh, where Unicorns of Love showed that they can defend an invade uh, with uh, true uh, forces uh, maybe they just decided against it and I think that's only see the only level of playmaking that PSG can create uh, early on in the game and then GP maybe can build an advantage against Renekton and then Lilia GP uh, might have uh, some uh, chances in a 2v2 uh, uh, top side but Hecarim and Ziggs can easily just play through mid into top and uh, not have a single worry so PSG scale super well, Oriana, Senna, Rakan, Gangplank, Lilia, all champions that scale well. You look at the other side, you have the Renekton and so forth. Not the biggest scalers in the world. So, Unicorns of Love, hard force bottom, GP died, but at what cost? I think Unicorns of Love almost got completely wiped. It turned into PSG getting Nasher. This was one of those cases where a team just overreached when they had a very simple win in front of them. The simple win in front of them was just play for Soul Drake. You don't need to rush for anything. Uh, you don't need to uh, force anything. You can just keep it cool. And uh, playing it the precise way in such positions is just uh, the better way forward because they definitely threw that game. And we could be sitting here in a different world where Unicorns of Love, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, won all uh, won this match and then auto qualified which is such a big deal there was so much on the line uh, for this tiebreaker and uh, a lot of people asked the question why was unicorns of love versus psg played first unicorns of love must be tired after that game uh, which is understandable but historically uh, in my experience always the highest seed matches get determined first and of course it's unfortunate but uh, there's two sides to, the, to that coin you could say unicorns of love is warmed up now and ready to go uh, you could say they're tired you can say that they didn't have time to prepare for psg uh, but um you know it's just uh, two sides of a coin and uh, i'm not here to speculate but uh, it is an interesting topic to expand on and uh, maybe we'll hear from unicorns of love themselves uh, in interviews because they were really outspoken about uh, how they prepared for matches the final game, which was also the final shit show, I hope, of the whole tournament, where uh, V3 find a way to make a worse draft uh, than before. Uh, I don't need to tell you guys uh, how why V3's draft is so horrible, but I'm going to do it anyway for those who didn't spend time on social media, because I think every analyst and their mother was talking about this draft. I made a joke about this draft. I spoke about it on the World's Analyst Desk. Uh, this draft is terrible because... Uh, usually, you know, you look at some part of it and you're thinking, wow, they're going to play for 2v2 mid and transfer that pressure, right? Where can they create pressure with this uh, uh, particular, uh, you know, draft? And um, right off the bat, you know, you look at Elise and you think to yourself, Elise versus Graves, that is a tough matchup for Elise. This matchup, Elise needs to legit... The first 10 minutes of the game be 5-0, needs to be snowballing the whole map, like needs to do crazy incredible things. And by no stretch of the imagination is V3 better individual players than LGD. I think uh, if anything, LGD looked fine in most early games. Their biggest weaknesses were their mid to late games. Even in this game, they managed to give up a couple of kills uh, when the game was so obviously over. It was the Graves first pick with Nidalee Lily out and... Um, it was uh, weird to see the set Elise lock in. You know, set mid lane works very well with some other AP champions like Nilly or Evelyn or Lilia. The problem with set Elise is that if Oriana, Oriana goes cleanse, they are just countered. Against set and Nidalee, going cleanse doesn't feel as good as it would against a set Elise. 
and this is the problem of the set Elise Lokin. Uh, Oriana Leona gets picked, and then we have Camille on third. Volibe Mordecai gets uh, gets banned. Okay, uh, we're fine with that. And LGD lock in Jax. Jax against Camille is a champ is a matchup that is, has been arg argued many times. I think Jax um, is good when the enemy team has, um, you know, for example, Twisted Fate because you can E the card. Maybe a, a Sejuani because you can E. Uh, some of those auto attacks that are eventually going to stun you is good against Braum too. There's a lot of champions that rely on, uh, you know, uh, passive uh, stacks that are applied with uh, basic attacks. Uh, nevertheless, against uh, Jax Camille is a skill matchup, and usually, you know, a big reason why a lot of pro players don't like this matchup with Jax is because uh, Camille is just such a strong champion overall. I think Camille's win ratio against Jax, Camille's win ratio against Renekton is absurdly high and competitive because Camille just fits in every mode of the game. If we think of Camille versus Jax's team fighting, Camille uh, wins because there's no Spear of Sojin. Uh, Camille uh, team fighting is better, her way of setting up ganks is better, her lane phase is decent enough to justify all of these other strengths. Uh, there are situations where I've seen Camille win against Jax too in lane phase and uh, all in all, uh, you know, I don't think Jax is some incredible hard counter. But in this particular case, uh, Jax uh, is solid enough to survive the onslaught of Elise for four minutes and then auto win the game because his team is just going to be uh, so much uh, better off. The final piece here was the Zaya Lokin. I don't understand the Zaya Lokin. It, it seemed almost like uh, a troll pick. Um, I don't know why Zaya was locked in here. I don't understand why Nautilus was the champion that you decided to pick into uh, Leona. I, I couldn't follow uh, the thought process at all here from V3 and looking at the game every time I look to the right of my screen. Um, V3's draft is equivalent of um, LGD's level of play uh, throughout uh, this uh, group stage and LGD uh, definitely stumbled their way uh, through um, the entire group. They won against V3 here and they won against V3 twice and... Um, I don't know, like, I don't want to be inflammatory, but uh, LGD was a massive disappointment, and uh, I don't mind at all that my prediction was way off when it comes to LGD. Uh, maybe it will change. It's the nature of best of ones. It's the nature of human beings, you know, if things just uh, fall into place better, you get LGD is going to get one break day now before they face, of course, Rainbow 7 in the best of five. For those who don't know uh, how uh, the group play-ins work is... Uh, First team auto qualifies to the world championship. See you later. Boom. Three and four play a best of five for a slot uh, to compete in a best of five against the second place team in group A. So most likely either a super massive or team liquid depending on how their match goes and maybe if uh, uh, everything uh, uh, goes um, ridiculously wrong, maybe we'll have some tiebreakers between Mad Lions and super massive or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I didn't look at the scenarios completely. Maybe Mad Lions with their 1-2 position might be just guaranteed to play, uh, you know, uh, an additional best of five. I don't know exactly how it works, so I don't want to speculate too much. We can uh, look into that tomorrow when it's uh, more relevant. Uh, but my point is 3 and 4 play a best of five to play against the second seed in the other group. And um, the same thing for group A. 3 and 4 play for a chance to now face against Unicorns of Love. So Unicorns of Love... It's a strange position because there's a chance that they are going to uh, face a Mad Lions. I think the odds are pretty uh, damn high that that's going to be the case, looking at how the group is and the level of the group. I think Supermassive and Team Liquid are competing for first. That's the first match of uh, uh, the day. So that's um, super exciting. Team Liquid and Supermassive showed a very high level gameplay. Um, looking at the future, PSG... I don't know which groups they can land in. Uh, I imagine, like, the only group for sure they can't land in is, uh, of course, um, the group with Machi, because you can't have two teams from the same region. Machi is from the PCS2. Uh, especially now when we are not sure about where Mad Lions and LGD will land. If Mad Lions and LGD are going to go through play-ins and they're going to be in group, 
then they can only slot in into two specific groups because there's already four LPL teams then and four EU teams. So that makes uh, the predictions of where they're going to land much easier. In that case, PCS would be with Rogue. I mean, PSG would be together with Rogue, uh, JDG and Damwon, which is a very dangerous group. And uh, uh, the story of PSG now is just uh, that they are going to play with their main roster now. And I don't think any fan out there should give... Uh, that PSG roster if they don't win <laughs> any type of crap because we can't know the situation we can't blame them for the situation and I think it's just uh, you know something that we should celebrate uh, the greatness of PSG and what they managed to accomplish uh, with the situation there's a world where those players are going to play incredible too I think um, PSG did a wonderful job of accommodating their players and making them feel as comfortable as possible. It is a team process and uh, I am excited for, to see what PSG brings to the table next. Un Unicorns of Love had a lot of creative drafting and uh, it came down to that big throw. Uh, they still play with a hint of disrespect and I think uh, there is some fine tuning to do. Uh, when it comes to their gameplay but i'm very intrigued by their drafting and that's going to be super exciting when it comes to the best of fives so i think whatever team is going to come and face them uh, probably mad lions is going to really really have to fight for their money especially the shape that mad lions is in so i think uh, regardless of what best of five we're going to have for unicorns of love is going to be super super hype i wonder in the conversation of best of fives if teams are better off like mad lions to play one additional best of five facing a team like legacy where odds are you're going to win it uh, sure there's a chance that you don't i don't want to neglect that completely with how crazy this plans has been but maybe you get all of that bullshit out of your system you figure out how you want to draft you figure out how you want to play because historically playing teams from major regions tend to go pretty damn far i remember world elites from a couple of years ago they went pretty damn far we had the cloud nine run where they beat us uh, after playing and play-ins and beat us, they beat RNG, they beat Genji, went all the way to semis. Playing play-ins and coming out of it, uh, you know, intact is, in a lot of cases, healthy. So uh, there is definitely a lot of uh, room for growth for teams. I think G2 also came through play-ins because they had the regional qualifier and they went all the way to semis. Uh, there is uh, definitely, you know, a lot of cool stories about teams doing crazy good coming out of play-ins. So I don't think we should make our judgments too harsh when it comes to these teams. There's still a lot of room to grow uh, for all of them. And uh, uh, the World Championship is always a story of growth. IG didn't look super clean when they won the World Championship in their group stage. They didn't even get first in their group. And then they faced off against KT and came out of that, you know, like with the Aatrox wings, you know, boom, after winning KT, they just looked unstoppable afterwards right same thing for fpx they almost dropped uh, uh, the first uh, seed against splice they dropped the game against splice and then they dropped the game against Fnatic, and then slowly slowly they got there and then boom comes the final and they look unstoppable world championship is a story of growth and these teams have more time to grow uh, then you know uh, they, ha they don't have more time to grow but they have more time to you know get that experience get those stage games in because that's so so important because we've noticed now how much that experience matters mad lions without that experience seem to be struggling it's just an example uh, but of course this is all speculation r7 not lgd i'm sure people are going to ask me for my predictions but uh, with how things look like right now if lgd is going to continue uh, playing in the same manner i think rainbow seven is looking like the more uh they, they look like a team with a soul. LGD just look completely soulless and uh, Orn uh, can build anything on that anvil. So he built them a soul, but Orn is not going to be something that they're ever going to see light of again. And if Rainbow 7 is not going to run it down and draft the same way uh, V3 did. So LGD is not going to get any freebies here. But LGD is still on paper when it comes to pound for pound players when they are performing as, you know, like on a good day then definitely LGD, uh, you know, if we look at the whole year as a whole, then LGD definitely look like favorites here. And uh, one day, in one day, a lot can change. In one day, also nothing can change. Uh, we don't know the inner workings of LGD, but I don't think we should assume that this is going to be 3-0 or something. This is going to be uh, probably a close series. And uh, maybe if LGD, through this best of five, also get their shit together, whoever they're going to face uh, on the other side, 
might also be in danger. So I don't think we should jump to too harsh conclusions. We can sit here and be in shock and in awe with the entertainment, with entertainment that we were provided throughout this day. All in all, game day three was just, um, you know, beautiful. Uh, forgive me for repeating things over and over. I'm very, very tired. It's been a very exciting day. The cold times over here in Europe are very early in the morning. So when you guys are still in bed, I have to be at uh, the show uh, three, four hours before because we have to do a little rehearsal to know what graphics are going to come up and so forth. And then um, we sit around and do nothing. We have a little bit of a breakfast, eat a sandwich, and then we get dressed and then we jump into uh, the show. So this was a summary. These summaries just keep getting longer. These, uh, these summaries just keep getting longer. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how to how to fix it, uh, but I hope you guys can uh, stay along with me. And uh, for the next one, I hope uh, that I can make it a little bit shorter uh, to gain you guys a little bit more time. Thank you so much for watching. All the best uh, to all of you. If you sneeze during this video, bless you and bless your face. All the best, guys.